Welcome to part two of this tutorial on countermeasures. In part one, we looked at dispensers, and now we're going to look at the active jamming pots. Before we start, let's have a little higher level background on how radar guided missiles work. There are two basic types of radar. We have search radars, and then we have tracking and engagement radars. Search radars use radar pulses to detect targets over a wide area, whereas tracking radars primarily use continuous wave radar over a narrow area. Though some tracking radars such as the SA-11 do use pulse radar to locate its target before switching to continuous wave. Now continuous wave is used to allow faster and more precise tracking which is required to lock onto a fast moving target and to provide accurate missile guidance. Your radar warning receiver will detect the change to CW and you'll know that you're being locked and a launch is imminent. Once a missile is launched, the tracking radar stays in continuous wave, but there is a change of frequency, which again is detectable and so you'll be alerted of a launch. This is the case for all older SAMs and air to air missiles. More modern active missiles have their own continuous wave radar built into the missile itself. So they can be launched using pulse radar to give rough guidance and then the missile turns on their own radar when it's close to the target, which is needed for that terminal guidance. This is called going pitbull. The consequence of this, of course, is that you get very little warning that an active radar missile has been fired. Luckily for us in DCS, there are no active homing SAMs. However, there are active air-to-air -air missiles. The purpose of a jammer then is to try to ensure that the signals being returned to the radar cannot be deciphered. However, the closer you are to the radar, the more likely it is that the return signal can be understood, and this is known as burn through. That's probably as much detail as we need for DCS, but before we jump in the cockpit, let's take a look at the jammer itself. Now the Harrier doesn't have an internal jammer, so we have to fit an external pod, and this has to be fitted on the centre pylon. This means that if you want a T-pod, then it needs to go on a wing station and you'll lose the weapons available on that station. So you need to consider if the benefit of a jammer is worthwhile. And we'll look at that shortly. In the cockpit, there is a single five position control on the ECM panel to control the jammer. Those positions are off, standby, bit, receive, and repeat. In DCS, there's no bit test and no need to warm up the pod. So in effect, off, bit, and standby all do the same, which is nothing. But it can be used if you want to follow a realistic startup and shutdown procedures. In receive mode, the jammer will start to emit pulse jamming and the P jam light will illuminate along with the HUD and RWR symbology once a pulse radar is detected, even a friendly one. Opponents shouldn't get range information on you until they burn through the jamming, but they will know that you're out there somewhere and are likely to know your azimuth, when otherwise they might not. It will, however, reduce the range at which an opponent will be able to fire on you, and by how much depends very much on the type of radar. Once burn through is achieved and they manage to get a lock, the jammer will automatically switch to CW jamming and the CW jam light will illuminate. Repeat or barrage jamming as it's sometimes called 
constantly emits both pulse and CW jamming. This will let everyone know that you're there, even beyond the range at which they could detect you. Barrage jamming does, however, typically reduce the firing range even further compared to receive mode, but only by a tiny amount. So which mode is best depends on the situation and the threat. One final thing to mention is that if you try turning the jammer on when no pod is fitted, the pulse and CW no-go lights will both illuminate. So let's look at how effective jamming is. The following table shows the launch ranges of various SAMs when faced with no jamming and then jamming in receive and repeat modes. Each test was repeated between three and nine times and conducted at the same speed, height and azimuth whilst in the Harrier. So these numbers will change if any of those factors change. Therefore, these figures are only indicative. As you can see, the effectiveness of the jammer varies. In receive mode, the launch range is fairly consistent, whilst in repeat mode, not only does it give slightly more protection on average, but it's usually a more random variation. Overall though, the jammer can be fairly effective against certain SAMs like the SA2, SA8, and surprisingly the SA11 and 15. The SA3, 6 and 10 however, don't seem to be affected a great deal, so it's probably not worth carrying the DZM pod if you know that that's what you're going to be facing. One other thing I've noticed is that some missiles can be trashed by turning on the jammer immediately after launch. And this can definitely work with the SA6, 11 and 15 and might work with some other SAMs as well. Finally, let's look at CW jamming. And that's something that I've not really been able to discern with any accuracy. However, it seems that CW jamming doesn't really jam the missile per se. What seems to happen is the missile is less likely to get a direct hit and therefore it's easier to dodge using manoeuvring. So if we imagine that the Harrier here is the bullseye, then without jamming, the missile will hit somewhere on the target circle. It might get a direct hit or a near miss which causes damage. With jamming, the target area is bigger. So you still might get a direct hit, but there's a higher probability of a miss and evasive maneuvering is likely to be more successful. Here we have a screenshot of an SA6 against a non-maneuvering target. This one is without jamming, in which we're going to get a direct hit, as I showed earlier. And now with jamming, where the missile is likely to miss or just cause minor damage. I haven't been able to accurately measure the effectiveness of CW jamming, as there are too many variables. So the results in this table are somewhat subjective and based on test firings at about 70% of the maximum range of the missile. Against SA2, 3 and 8, CW jamming appears to be the most effective. However, the large warhead of the SA2 can often still cause blast damage. Against SA6 and 15, they appear to be moderately effective, with the missile missing a non-maneuvering target about 20% of the time at around 70% of its range. Against SA10s and 11, the effectiveness seems very limited.
that's all for today so thank you for watching and please do hit like and subscribe but for now i need to land and the lso on the george washington here really doesn't like me so i'm gonna have to sneak aboard